It's a magical and dark world after all. Disney parks are known to be one of the happiest places on earth and beloved by children and adults. Yet, they seem eerie and fans often think something is off about them. Disney and their parks are notoriously mysterious as their inner workings are often kept secret. What happens at Disney usually stays there. So naturally, the parks inspire a bunch of urban legends. Most of them tell sinister tales of events conspiring in hidden rooms or hauntings or Disney just doing everything to keep their image clean. While Disneyland or Disney World Creepypasta is mostly fiction, not all of it is a hoax. Even the most outlandish stories usually have some sort of truth to them. They have a fair share of dark secrets, bizarre practices and downright creepy imagineering choices surrounding the parks or are buried beneath them. So let's dive into the dark world of Disney theme park secrets. Before we immerse ourselves fully in the House of the Mouse, we should look at the history of Disney parks. There are currently 12 active Disney parks across six resorts, which are all operated by the Walt Disney Company. Every park has its own theme and features Disney-owned IPs. Things that aren't really Disney, like Starbucks, get a Disney glow up. The parks usually encompass multiple hotels, restaurants, attractions and seasonal fairs that suit the theme and featured characters. The parks are known for the astonishing amount of detail put into everything, be it food or customer service. All of those little details come together to make the Disney magic happen. Disney and its parks are so ingrained into popular culture that they have amassed a large adult following, which is often lovingly dubbed Disney adults. While for some it's just nostalgia, for others it's definitely a lifestyle. So it comes to no surprise that there is a lot of Disney content out there, be it super dark or really happy. Most parks are in the US and either belong to Disney World or Disneyland Resort which is why we'll mostly focus on those two in this video. Disneyland Park is Disney's first theme park and opened its doors in Anaheim, California on July 17, 1955. Walt Disney closely supervised its creation and intended the park to entertain both children and adults. To this end, he envisioned meticulous designs for exciting attractions and added details that either adults or children could see because of the height differences. So the magical details really were there from the beginning. However, Disneyland's opening wasn't that magical. Construction deadlines were just too tight and the park was nowhere near being ready for guests yet. The few rides that were open broke down. Most notably, the Mark Train riverboat ride sank while a gas leak engulfed Sleeping Beauty's castle in flames. But no one got seriously injured, so it's fine. Aside from that, people flooded the park on opening day because fake entry tickets circulated. The park went out of food and water and the TV livestream was just a complete mess. Opening day was such a disaster that the Walt Disney Company dubbed it Black Sunday and claimed that the next day was Disneyland's official opening day. They did this until a few years ago. So the first day was totally just a practice round. It doesn't count guys, really, it, it was just practice. Disney World's first park opened in 1971 near Orlando, Florida as Magic Kingdom. Conceptually, it should extend Disneyland's fairy tale theme by adding larger attractions and featuring more characters. But obtaining the keys to Magic Kingdom's land was a huge undertaking and spawned interesting theories. To prevent land prices near Orlando from skyrocketing, Disney kept the plans for the new park secret and used dummy companies to buy land over multiple months. As people caught onto these mystery companies after most of the paperwork was done, hoaxes spread that the CIA helped Disney buy the land and that the government was involved. Today, signs and shops on Magic Kingdom's main street carry the names of the mystery companies to commemorate that without them, Disney World might not exist. It's a nice touch, but the secrecy and shadiness of the whole process just make it a bit unsettling. But not as creepy as Epcot, the experimental prototype community of Tomorrow Park that was added to Disney World in 1982. Epcot was originally planned to be a fully functioning city, with its own government. But after Walt Disney's death, Epcot's concept was changed from Mickey Mouse's kingdom to celebrating technology and cultures worldwide, which is arguably less creepy. Still, the community part went into a gated Disney neighborhood project years later, so the creepiness wasn't totally lost here. The other additions to Disney World were less eerie. Hollywood Studios is a show business themed park that was added to Disney World in 1989, while the Nature and Animal Conservation Park Animal Kingdom opened in 1998. Disneyland's latest extension, California Adventure Park, was completed in 2001 and was initially designed around Epcot's original concept. Yikes. 
But again, Disney didn't follow through with this extremely uncanny choice and they changed the theme to celebrating Californian culture via Pixar and Disney characters. Today, the parks are a major source of whimsical entertainment and they offer their loyal fandom a magical escape from real life. And food. But behind the magic are eerie secrets that would turn any fairy tale into a dark creepypasta. Disney parks are vast and a lot of their space is hidden from visitors. Since secret rooms make great creepypasta content, fans have made up a lot of stories surrounding those. While some details like zombie cast members or haunted costumes might not be totally accurate, the places described in those stories are real. The most notorious secret places are the Pike's intricate underground tunnel systems. These tunnels are called utility corridors or utilidors in short. According to the origin myth, Walt Disney was bothered by the sight of a cowboy CM at Tomorrowland because they didn't fit the futuristic theme of that part of Disneyland. So he came up with utilitors to place everything that keeps the park running, including CMs underground. Every Disney resort has utilitors, but the ones at Magic Kingdom are by far the most impressive. The utilitors spend most of Magic Kingdom's underground space and connect different subterranean areas like stock rooms, computer and surveillance systems, cast member areas and kitchens. Cast members use the utilitors to navigate the parks, prepare and deliver food to above ground restaurants and get ready for their shifts. Multiple dressing rooms, a hair salon and a mousqueteria which is a cafeteria for CMs only, are tucked away in the utilidors. The Pike's trash management system is also connected to the tunnels and shoots garbage from trash cans down to the utilidors via pipes every 30 minutes. The utilidors really are more like a subterranean city than actual corridors. Although they serve a good purpose, it's kind of eerie to think that there's a whole secret city hidden beneath you when you walk around Magic Kingdom. Leaked pictures show that the utilitors look creepy and resemble backrooms. Backrooms are those weird transitional places that seem oddly familiar yet unsettling. The backrooms are often depicted as empty corridors, but at the same time they feel like they are not as empty as you'd think. Maybe something not entirely friendly is waiting in the backrooms or utilitors. Both are vast, complex and quite possibly haunted by Mickey Mouse. Also, the Magic Kingdom utilitors are not technically underground, they're more like the first level of Disney World. Everything above ground is just built on top of them, which is really cool, but also a bit creepy. Another infamous hidden attraction of Disney parks is Disney Jail. Despite countless urban legends making it seem like a hoax, it's a real place. Visitors usually end up in Disney jail for shoplifting, inappropriate behavior or being intoxicated. Security just holds them there until things either settle or police arrives to take over. Despite many people going to Disney jail, its location is somewhat mysterious. Some people place it in the utilitors, while others are convinced it's located behind an innocuous storefront. Visitors and creepypasta often describe Disney Jail as an eerie and empty place with endless white halls. The corridors allegedly lead to dark jail cells with barred windows and feature odd decorations, like a police officer Mickey overlooking an interrogation room. Recounts also mention songs like It's a Small World playing on repeat to cause discomfort in visitors. It's a bit much, but I can really see Disney theming everything, including jail cells. The creepypasta Disney's Catacombs by horror fan 664 popularized these tropes and Disney urban legends in general. In the story, three friends try to explore a Disney theme park at night, but then get caught by security and escorted to Disney jail. The friendly security guard then leaves them in one of the many white rooms. The friends then decide to leave the room after waiting for a while but upon exiting, they get chased by costumed Disney characters while It's a Small World blares through speakers. After they barely escape the endless Disney catacombs, they run into CMs that stare at them lifelessly. The CMs then chase the friends following a park announcement that three fugitives are at loose in the park. Although most of this story is fiction, some CM interviews have collaborated details like songs playing in the background, endless hallways and really creepy white rooms. Some even go as far as to say that you never truly feel alone in Disney jail. Something is just always watching you. Maybe it's police officer Mickey. Urban legends aside, the actual Disney jail seems to be a security office or holding area rather than a cell filled with Mickey police merchandise. 
However, when actress Blake Lively visited Disney Jail for entering Disneyland without a ticket, it was an extremely uncanny place. According to her, Disney Jail consisted of mostly white rooms with all white furniture, and everyone was dressed in white too. Walt Disney's apartment in a firehouse on Main Street is another secret place hidden in plain sight. While you have to pass it to enter Disneyland, not everyone is aware of it. Visitors are even less aware that besides housing the Disney family, the apartment was built to observe crowds entering the park. You can also eavesdrop on people outside the firehouse. Allegedly, Walt Disney and his family did a lot of people watching and eavesdropping to gather opinions on the park. It's common lore that Walt Disney really loved his apartment, and according to some CMs, he loved it so much that he never truly left. Whenever he was at Disneyland, he'd turn on a lamp close to the people watching windows, even after he died. A CM taking care of the apartment after his death reported that the lamp would turn on repeatedly after he had turned it off. Now the lamp is always on in honor of Walt Disney and his everlasting presence in the parks. Or maybe they just gave up on trying to turn it off all the time. Speaking of hidden places, there are quite a few secret VIP rooms, dining places and lounges at the Disney parks. Some are owned by companies, others are only accessible via memberships. While they all range from cool to creepy, the most mysterious of the bunch surely is Club 33. Club 33 is a private dining club that grants its members and their guests exclusive access to lounges throughout Disney resorts. Originally, Club 33 was inspired by the VIP pavilions built for sponsors at the World Fair that Walt Disney World worked on, and hence exclusive to park sponsors. But after his death, individual memberships were offered. Without invitations, the waiting list is around 14 years long, and you have to pay a hefty fee to stay in Mickey's club. Considering the exclusivity, rumors started to spread that Club 33 was associated with secret societies or even a cult itself. Most popular theories connect Club 33 with Freemasons and the Illuminati. Those usually claim that Walt Disney was a 33 degree Freemason, which is the highest rank one could have. Inside pictures of him at gatherings in Masonic outfits as evidence. So he basically was a Freemason Hokage. Apart from hidden Mickeys, Walt Disney allegedly hid Freemason symbols throughout Club 33 decorations. There are a bunch of urban legends tying Club 33 to satanic rituals and evil plots. But my favorite theory is that 33 just looks like Mickey's and Minnie's ears next to each other, and that 3 of course stands for the Illuminati. Apart from secret societies, there are allegedly a bunch of hidden entrances and exits to the houses of the mouse. Technically, all utility entrances are connected to the outside in some way. Remember, they have to get deliveries through the utilities, and the trash has to go somewhere. But urban legends like to get a bit more creative than that. According to a popular myth, a hidden passage leads from outside Disneyland to Tom Sawyer's island. Sadly, this one has been debunked as a CM myth, but there are some safety and evacuation tunnels that span multiple rides. And maybe some of them lead to the utilities, and those lead outside. Have you ever wondered why everything at Disney parks just seems so perfect and smells like vanilla? Well, it's because it's Imagineer to be this way, Baka. Disney Imagineers stop at nothing to ensure that visitors have a magical experience. So they meticulously add details to everything in the park to Imagineer the Disney magic. Nothing is truly accidental at Disney parks. Everything aims to evoke emotions and appear as enchanting as possible. Of course, things have to be branded sufficiently, so you never forget about the IPs. But apart from all the obvious details, like hidden Mickeys or lovingly crafted novelty food, there are some more sinister manipulations at work. Imagineers didn't stop at cute branding. They are actively using all of our senses to imagineer a perfect park visit. And one of the best senses to use is smell. Smells are highly entangled with emotions and associations. Certain smells like vanilla can trigger happy memories, while other smells like salty air breezes can make you feel super immersed on like a pirate ride. Imagineers exploit this concept and automatically dispense smells throughout the parks via smellitizers. Depending on which theme or effect Disney wants you to experience, different scents are used. On Main Street, baked cookie smell is set loose to make you believe sweet treats are freshly produced in the shops, when really, they just hail from the utilities. The Haunted Mansion ride features dusty breezes, so you know that you're in a long abandoned house. And it goes even further. The Disney fireworks are accompanied by gingerbread and other nostalgic 
specific smells to make them feel extra special. In fact, most smellitizers try to trigger nostalgia in some way, so visitors associate happy memories with Disney park visits and come back to experience this happiness and all the nostalgic memories again and again. However, if smells get dispensed too soon or overpowering, they'll disrupt the immersive experience. The suggestive power of smellitizers lies within their subtlety, so they need to be timed and tuned perfectly. You don't want to get sprayed with sugar cookie fun time by a gigantic Mickey statue every time you walk on Main Street. Smellitizers also have to blend in with the environment, so they are usually camouflaged as innocuous props like small vents, lanterns, or just speakers. Another subtle ways for Imagineers to manipulate our perception are colors. Similar to smells, colors are highly entangled with associations and emotions. But again, Disney found a more creative way for color coding. To avert our eyes from non-magical parts of the parks, Imagineers designed a specific shade of green that is subconsciously ignored by humans. A surprising amount of scientific research went into Go Away Green, which hides construction sites, entrances, or CM-only areas. I wish they'd sell Go Away Green as merch. Imagineers also use colors to distinguish themes and attractions in the parks. Whenever you enter a different area of the parks or rides, the color scheme switches. And along with it, the architecture of buildings and the texture of the floors you walk on change. Often, floor levels differ just a tiny bit on transitions between parts of the park to subconsciously enforce the change. So be careful or you might end up tripping into Tomorrowland. Besides colors, Imagineers also use perspective to fool us into thinking that objects are either smaller or larger. The iconic castles are the heart of every Disney park and they seem ginormous and really impressive. But actually, they aren't. The castles are way smaller than we think. Imagineers just used forced perspective to create an optical illusion. Forced perspective adjusts the scale of objects in relation to the spectator to increase or decrease perceived depth. To make an object appear far away and taller, the size of surrounding objects is decreased along the farthest point from the spectator. Even though they are artificially shrunk, our experience tells us that they are smaller because they are farther away. A good example of that is Cinderella's castle. It has a large base and all of its details are getting tinier with increased height. This tricks us into thinking it's gigantic when it's actually just 77 feet tall. Imagineers then amplify this effect by adding lights that pronounce the different scales. Imagineers also shrink structures with forced perspective. The American Adventure Pavilion in Epcot appears to be a two-story building, even though it has five floors. Perspective is also used to add expressions to costumed characters like Marie or Minnie. Depending on the angle CMs tilt their heads, characters can express different emotions. This also got rid of the eerie and soulless smiles those costumes were known for. Imagineers aim to give people the most perfect but simultaneously safe experience. So in order to make people believe that they are actively pushing the limits on dangerous rides, they use special effects, like fans and fast sounds to make rides seem faster, shaking heights to evoke danger, and filling double glass windows with bubbling water to give visitors the impression that they are underwater. Another great example of special effects is the Tower of Terror. Its elevator drop is a strictly controlled downward pull with added wind, and the screams you hear at the entrance are just pre-recorded and not actual guests screaming. Apart from some dangerous rides and visitors just misusing attractions, Mickey wants you to be physically safe and just psychologically scared and brainwashed. Smellitizers and weird mind manipulation aside, there are some even more bizarre Imagineering masterpieces at Disney parks. Take the plants in Tomorrowland for example. To fit its theme of sustainability and self-sufficiency, all plants had to be edible. Imagineers planted common vegetables like kale and fruits along with modified plants. Those are mostly changed to look prettier than their common counterparts or are more resilient to insects. Either way, Imagineers still select plants that are both beautiful and functional with great care. After all, most people don't notice that the bushes they pass are composed of herbs, and Imagineers would like to keep it this way. Still, you shouldn't go around snacking on decorative grapevines. To keep the plants pristine, they are sprayed with a lot of pesticides, which also suits the theme of sustainability. Another weird design choice is Animal Kingdom's Tree of Life. While it imitates nature astonishingly well, 
It's just a man-made sculpture of a baobab tree. The fake tree features carvings of extinct and existing animals and thousands of artificial leaves. It is based on a mythological tree of life that connects all creations and it shares a similar origin story. According to a popular myth, Disney's tree of life is a real tree that mysteriously features carvings of animals. It was allegedly bought from its original owners, carefully extracted and then planted in Disney World. Talk about effort here. Animal Kingdom itself is one of the best zoos in the world and enforces some of the strictest standards to ensure the comfort of captured animals. Still, the park is a theme park and uses some tricks to keep visitors entertained. Animals are rewarded with air-conditioned rocks, cool water and their favorite treats to hang out at spots close to visitors. Animal Kingdom inhabitants aren't really magically people-friendly after all, they are just bribed. Speaking of animals, there are some smaller visitors like rats, birds and mosquitoes that are surprisingly hard to find at the parks. Because they could easily ruin your magic, they are just imagined away. Considering Disney World is located in Swampland, Florida, the park formed the Mosquito Surveillance Program to monitor the mosquito population and find effective ways to eliminate them. This includes placing carbon dioxide traps everywhere in the park, spraying insecticides and fostering natural predators. All of this is pretty standard, but they also use a more unsettling method of dealing with mosquitoes. Disney keeps sentimental chicken in coops all over Disney World to check their blood for mosquito-borne illness. If any mosquito illness haunts the pike, they can effectively detect it and take measures. And don't worry about the chimkins. Besides taking their blood, the pikes don't harm them and they seem to take pretty good care of them. Other birds aren't treated as nicely. To prevent them from stealing food or pooping all over the place and visitors, Disney pikes play sounds of distressed birds. Doing so signals to the birds that there's danger and they should flee because other birds are being hurt. I wonder what Snow White thinks about that one. A more fluffy way to deal with furry plagues are Disneyland's cats. Hundreds of jellical cats are fostered by CMs to roam the pikes at night and get rid of rats. During the day, they are kept in secluded areas of the park, but sometimes visitors catch glimpses of them. But if cats get too social, CMs sadly have to remove them, since they could bite a visitor. So you better not feed them too many Mickey snacks. The cat's origin is somewhat mysterious. No one really knows when or where they came from. Some swear that the cats just randomly showed up one day and Disney just utilized them. While others swear that the parks actually bred them so they could get rid of Mickey's cousins. Disregarding their lore and rat murder, the whole thing is pretty cute. So cute that there's a whole website dedicated to the cats of Disneyland, with small profiles for each cat sighting. Imagineers often make us believe that artificially created things are real, but sometimes they try to get away with the opposite, which is arguably more disturbing. One of these instances involves real skeletons on Disney rides. When Imagineers were tasked to add bony characters to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, they couldn't find skeletons that were spooky enough. Plastic skeletons at that time just looked a bit too fake, so they did what everyone would do, take real ones. While the actual number of skeletons and the origin varies with source, the ride hosted these natural spooks for years. The most probable origin story is that UCL Matt donated the skeletons to the Imagineers, but the creepypasta version includes the donation of an Imagineer, so they could remain at the park forever. As special effects and prop technology progressed, the ride's bony friends gradually got replaced by artificial skeletons. Disney now claims that there are no human remains left at this ride, but CMs and VIP tour guests swear that at least one skull is still real. The remaining genuine skull is supposedly placed on a skeleton that sleeps in the captain's bed. Evidence like color changes with aging, cracks and extra details inside the skull are used to support this claim. Another prop that was rumored to be real is Madame Leto's spell book. Fittingly displayed in the Haunted Mansion seance room, the book was allegedly a genuine grimoire from the 14th century. According to urban legends, the book however had one problem it didn't stay put. CMs swear that they would find the book in different spots every day and had to return it to its display. So Disney replaced it with a more user-friendly Imagineer version. It's hard to say if there's any truth to this story, mostly because it's completely based on CM lore. But considering the amount of weird artifacts in Disney parks, it wouldn't surprise me if there was an actual spell book at some point and Imagineers just took inspiration from that. Wherever you go in Disney parks, 
Security cameras are sure to follow you. Disney parks have excellent security systems that overlook everything that happens in Mickey Mouse's kingdom. So of course, they watch your every move. Part of that system are CM teams that monitor the cameras, alert security and track crowds or individual visitors. And they kind of have to do that, considering the amount of visitors that attend the parks every day and how easily someone could spoil the magic for everyone. Disney parks are filled with children, so of course missing kids are a major concern. But thanks to the park's excellent security measures, no child has officially gone missing in the parks. Like ever. Never happened. In none of the parks. Even for a world-renowned security system, that's impressive. And many fans think it's odd. So of course, rumors started to spread about missing kids at Disney parks. Some anonymous CM accounts say that hundreds of children go missing and are never found. But since they're technically taken outside the parks or just slip through the system, it's easy for the parks to dissipate the blame and convenient. You probably don't want to take your kid to a place that's known for missing children, unless you really don't like them. None of these urban legends point to specific cases or stick around, except for one. In the 80s, a 16-year-old got taken from a Disneyland parking lot. Shortly after, stories circulated that around 200 kids go missing at the parks every year and are then sold. Besides the initial story, the tale of a toddler getting snatched from its stroller while the parents weren't looking is often cited as proof of these incidents. Allegedly, LA police still receive calls from concerned parents about the missing children situation at Disneyland. According to them and Disney, it's all just a hoax. If you think this is bad, Tokyo Disneyland has an even worse version of this creepypasta. Instead of the kids just getting sold, their organs are actually harvested and then sold on the black market. Despite some clearly made up stories, there have been some believable instances, similar to the case from the 80s, where kids have gone missing around the parks or after visiting them, while cases could just slip through the cracks, Disney parks have intricate rules in place where CMs actively look for stray kids and must stay with them until they find their guardians. So maybe those rules were implemented after some tragic events had taken place. Or maybe Mickey is just watching you more closely than you realize and it's really impossible to kidnap someone at Disney parks. Besides security cameras and CMs watching visitors, the parks implement cutting edge tracking technology. Most surveillance is conducted by the parks apps, magic bands or simply observing your ride and purchase history. Disney is steadily evolving its tracking to improve customized recommendations and experiences. Fans commonly chalk it up as enhancing the Disney magic, but it's unsettling to think how much data the parks are actually collecting on you. Just logging your visit in detail and giving you amenities like standby passes or reservations allows Disney to pinpoint your location and predict your right choices, food, and buying habits. Adding data collection in services and tracking your location with magic bands grants Disney almost complete access to its visitors because most willingly accept tracking for convenience and access to attractions. It's genius since Mickey will know you better than you do. From what we see, the data is mostly used for personalized in-app suggestions, services, or to control crowds. If some place is popular and not suitable for upcoming weather conditions, the system might try to reroute you to another attraction you'd like. Honestly, that's pretty cool, and you might end up discovering places you never thought of, but you actually love. But what if they'd use the system not in your best interest, but in the parks? Instead of making your visit magical, the system could very well manipulate you into spending more money or wasting time on things you didn't plan on. You don't need to follow the recommendations, but if you're tired of making decisions all day and FOMO, then you might just go along with it. After all, the suggestions are always magically accurate and Mickey knows best. When talking about eerie services at the parks, Disney's customer service comes to mind. Fans often swear that CMs go above and beyond. Somehow, they just know what you like or when you need something and they're super accommodating even without visitors dropping clues. While this is really sweet and can save a Disney trip, it shows how much Mickey's friends are observing you. Countless posts online tell stories of how visitors lost something, like a plushy at Pikes, only to find it placed in a hotel room, along with additional decorations of their favorite characters or movies featuring those on the TV. Thanks, I guess. All this seems eerie, but Disney counts on extremely high customer satisfaction to ensure that visitors return to the parks. So CM guidelines, as well as the tracking system, are really just in place to ensure that you feel like you're actually in the happiest place on Earth. Using intricate systems to collect a lot of data to enhance the magic is just a logical step and pretty impressive. But also, hidden Mickeys are watching you, so you better turn on your VPN when you look up Elsa Smart.
The most magical yet unsettling thing about Disney parks is how they seem like another world with its own set of rules. While the park's immersion is impressive, there's also a more sinister reason behind the Mickey bubble. The parks originally were planned to be self-sufficient cities with their own Disney-controlled government. Epcot was supposed to be the first autonomous Disney city. Walt Disney envisioned it to be a city that would never cease to be a living blueprint of the future. As such, Epcot would be a testing bed for the latest technology, urban planning and government advances. The city's core was planned as a busy downtown area that be completely shut off from the residential area surrounding it. Similar to the concept of Epcot today, the downtown core would have areas themed after different cultures and countries, just like a mini Mickey World Fair. A green belt featuring edible plants would separate the core from residencies and keep the city self-sufficient. This is where Tomorrowland's influence comes in, but this is also where the cool parts of Epcot's original concept just turn a bit weird, because no one would own land at Epcot. Everyone would just rent their space from Disney. The reason for this is that owning land entails municipal voting rights and weighing in on decisions that weren't really compatible with Epcot's vision. Disney wanted the rights to change the city's infrastructures, residencies and things in people's homes without notifying residents. So someone could come home and just find a whole bedroom remodeled to be a futuristic sleeping pot. But don't worry, privacy invasion is only exercised to upgrade your home. Sticking with innovation cars would be banned from the city. According to Walt Disney, people only need a car for weekend trips and affairs outside the city, if we let them outside. That's not what he said, but it would be kind of fitting. The monorail would transport people between parks, while the people mover should handle traffic in Epcot. Supply trucks and cars were only allowed in Epcot's utilidors, since the city should remain a pedestrian paradise. This concept alone isn't all that weird. There are some cities like Rome that restrict car traffic during certain hours to reduce emissions and just traffic. However, these restrictions allow for driving your cars in the city during certain hours of the day. People aren't totally locked into towns implementing the system, but Disney planned for the residents of Epcot to mostly remain at Epcot. Potential citizens would need transport between the parks because they'd be encouraged to work for Disney. Even though working outside the parks would be permitted, Disney stated that everyone living in Epcot has the responsibility to maintain this living blueprint of the future. Epcot was designed as its own ecosystem, so working outside would defy its concept and thus be difficult. Like how will you even find your car? No matter what you do, Epcot would need you to have a job while you live there. Requiring residents to work, preferably at the parks, was fought to prevent slums and keep communities clean. It's difficult to know though where they draw the line, since Epcot had plans for schools and children don't work. So I guess kids are okay, but poor people or people that are retired are a no-go. Although some of these concepts concepts sound really insane, Disney planned to apply them all over the US by building more cities of the future. Epcot should have been just the beginning. It's interesting to see that the plans for Disney's iconic transportation systems and a lot of other cool parts of the parks stem from Epcot's concept. In a way, these plans and innovations truly became international, just how Walt Disney always wanted it to be. Just modified to be awesome and not disturbing. As for the self-governing city part, Epcot's concept wouldn't go to total waste either, but rather split into smaller projects with the same underlying theme. Epcot wasn't only designed to be a futuristic community, it should have also been a testbed for a Disney-controlled government. The Weddy Creek Improvement District, or ICID, should lay the foundation for Epcot's autocracy, but instead founded the park's own government. After purchasing the land for Disney World, Disney petitioned to found the district along with two cities, the city of Bay Lake and the city of Freddy Creek, on the outer bounds of Orange and Osceola County in 1967. This would allow them total autonomy over buildings, utilities, roads and emergency services. Disney argued that this was necessary to serve the needs of those residing in Epcot and to clarify the RCID's authority. The Supreme Court held the creation of the district to ensure it wasn't violating Florida's constitutions. But in the end, the RCID was formed. Although the original Epcot was never built, the RCID still governs Disney World. But who decides things in the RCID anyways? Currently, it's five board supervisors who are senior Disney employees and own land in the district. There are around 40 people living in the two original RCID cities. But since they own no land, they can only elect officials for their city. Because of its autocracy, RCID has control over law enforcement. 
Disney mostly contracts police forces from surrounding counties and the Florida Highway Patrol, but they also employ around 800 people in RCID's security division, alongside private guards. Arrests, citations and investigations are officially handled by Florida officials. Still, it's unsettling to think that it's hard to verify that. So after recording the video, I realized that the RCID might not exist for much longer. On April 22nd, 2022, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill into law that would effectively dissolve the RCID and strip it of its special rights come June 1st, 2023. As for why this is happening, the Disney company took a stance against the controversial Don't Say Gay bill and Florida state's leadership didn't really like that. So they decided to get back at Disney and take away the autocratic government privileges. However, not all hope is lost since Disney is fighting back. Lawsuits are being filed and the RCID could vote to reconstitute for adjustments that would make lawmakers happy. Also, Florida didn't release an official plan on how utilities and services would be handled after the RCID is dissolved. So it seems pretty likely that the RCID could live happily ever after. An interesting point here is the town of Celebration, Florida. The city is home to around 9,000 people and was once part of the RCID. Walt Disney's concept for Celebration was to be the quintessential American small town, or a suburban version of the original Epcot. Residents need to follow strict rules, like kids aren't allowed to walk to school, changes under home or law need to be permitted, and homes need to be pastel shades. Also, your pets must be greenlit. So sorry, but your exotic fighting gecko isn't Disney enough to live here. Because of its white picket fence scheme, residents informally call it the bubble, and claim that celebration is trying too hard to be perfect, which comes off as phony and disturbing. After Disney gave up Celebration in 2004, most landowners remained connected to Disney. So nothing really changed except the town isn't a liability for the company anymore. Celebration is also strongly linked to Disney World since most of the injuries sustained at Disney World are treated at Celebration's hospital. Celebration wasn't the end of Disney cities. In 2010, Disney announced Golden Oak, a luxury gated community with private clubs. Instead of being outside Disney World, this city is on a resort's premise, like the original Epcot. The city has different neighborhoods with distinct theming like cottage or Mediterranean. Every house features Disney related details and is almost like its own little theme park. For membership fees starting at 12k a year, residents get magic hours to stay longer at the parks, park passes, access to exclusive Disney World launches and transportation services to the parks. House maintenance, food services, and other amenities are also available to club members. Sounds familiar. Besides the lavish price tag of at least 2 million USD, there's not a lot of information available. Residents need to stick to strict renovation rules like the people living in celebration. And four out of the seven board seats are of course represented by Disney. Golden Oak is not the final boss of Disney communities. Again, I saw this after finishing the video, but at the beginning of 2022, Disney announced Story Living by Disney, which is a new residential community project with a magical Disney touch. According to their announcements and website, Story Living will offer Disney-themed homes and special community spaces that feature curated experiences. Those curated experiences sound pretty cool until you hear more about them. The team behind Story Living wants to combine a small town setting with storytelling, creativity and entertainment of a Disney resort. So Disney basically wants to imagineer your life and turn it into a carefully crafted fairy tale. And to do that, CMs will provide services and immersive experiences all over Story Living's neighborhoods and community spaces. This will either be really cool or super dystopian. And if you watch the trailer, you probably lean towards the latter. Oh, and Story Living isn't only one community in the Greater Palm Springs area. Disney is currently scouting out more suitable places. Which kind of makes me think that they actually want to bring back the original Epcot concept. In 2017, the LA Times published an article on how Anaheim is controlled by the happiest place on earth. Considering the business the parks bring, Disney holds sufficient power to pressure its home turf into granting subsidies and tax relaxations. By threatening to leave or not expanding the parks, Disney can request a lot of Anaheim. Considering everything on Disney property is managed by the mouse, it's hard to keep the parks in check. Because Disney is quite secretive about the park's operations, 
Reform museums and fans often allege that security is incentivized to keep incidents on the down low. An example of this is the Disneyland Space Mountain accident in 2000. After an emergency stop, nine passengers officially sustained minor injuries. However, some firefighters on the scene reported that the full extent of the accident was concealed. According to them, Disney security congratulated themselves on keeping details of the emergency radio. A year later, two victims attempted to sue Disney for permanent major injuries inflicted by the ride. Disney and Carl Osher officials still stand by their original statements, and the lawsuit didn't go anywhere. It's notoriously hard to get a hold of private records from companies like Disney, so it's hard to say what really happened and if other incidents are accurately reported or kept off the records. There's also a weird trend of accidents getting blamed on visitors' behaviors or their medical history. While people sometimes do stupid stunts and sadly have underlying health conditions, it's strange that almost every accident follows that pattern. There are a lot of creepy things surrounding Disney theme parks, and believe it or not, we just barely scratched the surface. I just selected some of my favorite creepy stories out of all the available Disney creepiness. And while some of them are more scary or goofy than others, the amount of detail and thought put into everything at Disney theme parks is really astonishing. Sure, some decisions and Epcot's original concept don't really fit the whole happiest place on earth plotline. But still, the parks are beloved internationally by fans for really good reasons. It's hard to say if there is anything paranormal or evil going on at Disney parks. Mostly because everything in this regard is based on CM lore. But the creepypasta is deliciously entertaining and trying to get to the bottom of some weird urban legends we've all heard before on some online forums is extremely fun. Even 10 years ago, Disney urban legends just had a pull that nothing else could easily replicate. Theme parks just always have this allure of being fun but also creepy. And with Disney, it's even darker because everyone has those fond memories of something related to Disney. Also, the Walt Disney company is overpowered and the security system is borderline scary, so it's just prime material for dark tales. No matter if you're a Disney adult or a creepypasta enjoyer, digging deeper into dark Disney lore is extremely interesting and entertaining. And hey, you never know, maybe it's a haunted world after all. But even if you're haunted by Mickey, you should like and subscribe.